some more. My name is Civic Association and we are the organization that is bringing you this Candidates Forum. It's in keeping with our mission to um, promote well-informed citizenry, um, to educate the public, and to invite participation. So you will all have the opportunity to ask questions in the course of this meeting. And so Thank you for being here. I don't have to tell you because you're here. This is a really important election. So um, we'll pass this on to Rich, who is going to be facilitating, even though there he is. He's up in. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for attending. My name is Richard Myers. I'm one of the board members of Norbert Civic Association. Uh, we have, as certainly as long as I've been on the board, and for a long time before that, Norbert Civic Association has sponsored candidate forums, uh, both at the primary level and for the general election, during which people can hear from our borough council candidates, mayoral candidates, and tax collector candidates to hear what their platforms are and to give you a chance to ask them questions. Here's the format that we're going to follow tonight. First, we're going to hear from Andrea Deutsch, who is our mayoral candidate, and she has up to four minutes to address us. Likewise, with Regina Watson running for tax collector. And then we will have uh, prepared questions asked of our five council candidates, who are Susan Snow. And if you could hold up your hand as I introduce you. So, because believe it or not, even though this is a small town, everybody really may not know you. <laughs> there are in the 2016 election, there were 3,900-some-odd registered voters. So if you don't know everybody, you're excused. So Susan Snow, Michelle Pananopoulos, Aaron Wooderick, Cindy Rickards, Jim Nixon. And they, are, they have picked lots, so they are each going to have three minutes to address you. Then we will have prepared questions for about an hour. We will take a short break. And then we will open it up to questions from the floor. And you can ask questions to our mayoral candidate, tax collector candidate, or any of the borough council candidates, and they will answer your questions. And then after that, we're going to adjourn. We are going to get you out of here on or before 10 o'clock. I hope you enjoy yourselves. Yes. I intend to. <laughs> OK, Andrea? You can use either this mic or yeah. Hi everyone. Good evening. My name is Andrea Deutsch and I am running to be the next mayor of Narborough. Uh, I'm a long time resident, having moved here in 1997. I, I bought my house on Brinwood Manor back the, over 20 years ago. Uh, I am also a long time business person. I own Spots, the place for pause, which has been in, running a business in Narborough for over 14 years. We're going into our 15th year. Am I okay? That's me. Yeah. Okay. Prior to owning spots, I was a litigation attorney for 10 years. I practicing in Philadelphia and in Norfolk. And, uh... Hold on. Hold on. We're just going to turn this down all the way. What? Is that this mic? That we know no one's okay. a hard. We're good. Okay. Everybody can still hear? <laughs> Um, I've also been a very active member of the community, having served on the, I'm currently serving on the library board. Uh, I've served on borough council, the business association, and many other uh, different things that make Norbert the wonderful place it is. Uh, mayors in, in places such as Norbert have a very defined role, and it's laid out by the Pennsylvania Code. With the supervisors of, of the police, we break ties in the event of ties on borough council, and we have the authority to veto potential uh, uh, legislation issued by borough council. In my role as mayor, I intend to work closely with our officers and borough council to shape our police force into the force that we deserve and one that represents our interests and what, what we'd like to see in a police force in a town such as Norway. Uh, I want to make it the best possible force for, uh, for our group out, the borough. We also have some unofficial roles as well, and they're the boosters of the community and champions of the town within which we live. I love Margaret, and I wish to see it thrive and grow, including having an active business community. I'll also work with the citizens of Margaret to make sure their concerns are heard, and by the people who need to hear those concerns, and make sure that those concerns, different concerns, get addressed. Uh, 
Again, I'll work closely with borough council, members of borough council. I'll work closely with uh, the borough office and, and the people that we need to thread together to make everything work as efficiently as possible. I ask for your vote on Tuesday, November 7th, so that uh, our community can move forward in a, in a wonderful, positive way and make us all happy to be citizens of this wonderful world. Thank you so much. Right, Regina. Regina, would you address us, please? Stand close to the mic, because it's the, the, okay. so it'll pick you up. Um, my name is Lisa Watson, and I'm running for tax collector. I've been a tax collector here in the borough since 1999. I collect county, borough, sewer, solid waste, and school. I enjoy working for the borough, and I look forward to being your tax collector for the next four years. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody put your hands over your ears. He needs to be away from Check, check, check. Okay, that's working. All right, now it's time for our borough council candidates to address you. And they have picked lots, so Susan Snow is going to go first. And during closing remarks, she's going to go last. Stand close to the mic. It's not working. I don't think it's on. It's not working. Okay, we're, we're going to get you there. use this one? If I win, I'm going to better show you. use that. That's if you have better sound technology. Okay, go ahead and speak into it. Hello, can you hear me? No. Go ahead, keep going. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Good evening. Go ahead. Check. Check. No. No. There's. You know what? I'm going to get you one more time. You can put it in that microphone, please. It's okay right here. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Susan Weston Snow, and I'm running for Borough Council with Norbert Voices, an independent party that was formed by myself and a committee of dedicated residents. I'd like to thank you all for attending this forum tonight, and I also want to thank the Civic Association for being so proactive in fostering community awareness by hosting events like this. Norbert Voices is giving all of us voters an alternate voice in next week's election. Prior to creating the party in August, this election was uncontested. My hope is to engage all residents in the democratic process that we know as citizens. I believe, along with everyone who supports me, that this is the right time to gently challenge our system so that we can come together as a community and face and focus on what is truly important to all of us. Good things can rise up from a healthy exchange of opinions in our local government. My 25 years of property manage management experience in Norbert and Greater Philadelphia area, and my extensive business background, along with my tried and true people skills, are the strengths that I can offer you. These skills, along with my history and knowledge of our issues as a lifelong resident, will make me a strong facilitator for your concerns and ideas. Presently, Norbert has some challenging but exciting issues ahead. This includes our downtown business district, infrastructure, modifying our new four base code as unforeseen issues arise, parking, safety, and density. The best solution to these issues will come from hearing more of our voices. I'm an advocate of the seniors in town. Our history and our wisdom can be found in them. They need to be socially included and economically considered. Finally, I would like to say that my life here as a third generation Norbeth resident has been blessed with incredible family memories and wonderful lifetime experiences. My sons were raised here and their character and integrity all grew and were nurtured here in Norbert. My heart is here and I truly believe it will always help me to guide us in the right direction. Thank you.
Michelle Pananopoulos. That, that's not going to fit. Can't do it. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and again, thank you to the Civic Association for holding another candidates forum, as you did in the spring and as you do every uh, election year. I'm a, I've been on the board of the Civic Association since 2013, so full disclosure, but I had nothing to do with planning this forum, so you know I don't know any other questions. I don't know anything. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons why I was um, excited about joining the Civic was precisely because of this mission to increase government transparency, increase citizen involvement. Um, I was really inspired by specifically Georgette's vision, and Georgette brought me into the Civic, and I just want to say again, thank you so much. It's been a really wonderful four years in the Civic Association Board. I've learned so much about this community, and I, I'm really proud of what the Civic continues to become. It's, it's growing, and it's, it's a great organization. So. A little pitch for the Civic. Anyway, um, I just want to be brief. I'm going to be very brief because we have a long evening ahead, and I really want to get to the interesting <coughs> stuff, which is, in my mind, your questions, the questions that have been submitted in advance and that you hopefully have come here to ask and want to hear what's on everybody's mind. Um, I've lived in Norworth for a little bit over 10 years. My husband, Alan, and I are raising our three children here. And the reason that I'm running for a borough council is because I want to do my part to preserve the qualities about Norworth that brought us here and that we love so much. Norbeth truly is a walkable, safe town where neighbors know one another and our children play together, we shop local, and the spirit of volunteerism is exceptionally strong. Um, over my years in the borough, I've contributed to the community in a number of ways, um, including being on the civic board for uh, the last four years. I'm also the judge of elections for Norbeth Ward 3, right here in this room. I'm sure I've seen many of you. <laughs> and I see you every election. Um, and uh, I also joined the zoning hearing board in January of 2016, so I've had the opportunity to interpret both the old and the new form of zoning codes. And I volunteered in a number of different other ways, from Dickens Festival to you know holding up the buckets of 4th of July. And it's just one of the things that I hold dear about this community are the ways that um, we work together and there are so many opportunities to volunteer and to get to know my fellow community members. Um, I'll be sad to have to give up some of those opportunities that I'm currently involved in should I go to the Borough Council, but right now we're in a very exciting time. There are a lot of borough projects and plans that are active from the form based code, the subdivision and hearing uh, ordinance, we're forming a capital plan, a facilities assessment and usage plan, we have a new historical preservation committee. We are undertaking a very am ambitious comprehensive plan and have appointed a committee and they've had a kickoff meeting on that. Um, there's economic development in, main, in the Main Street um, program that Susan alluded to. A lot of infrastructure, utilities, sewers. We have two bridge projects coming up. A parking study that we finished we need to implement. Traffic safety and traffic engineering. There's so much going on. And to me, it's a very exciting opportunity to be able to sit at the council table and be a contributor to helping to implement those things and move the borough forward. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Uh, when I was a child, I was brought to Narberth for the 4th of July. Walking through the tunnel, the field filled with blankets, what seemed like a hundred million people. Candy Cane City being the best playground that I ever, ever used. The embers from the fireworks falling into the crowd as we all cheer. And then later as a teenager, working on Forest Avenue in the building, office building 114, almost not even making the connection that those two experiences were the same place until later when my wife and I got married and we were looking for a place to live. An apartment on Forest Avenue just happened to show up in a realtor listing. And when I walked in, I knew. I remember our move-in day we came with our moving van, with our new furniture, and we couldn't get anywhere near our apartment because the entire street was closed for a music festival. <laughs> After a few moments of frustration, we decided to uh, stash the van a few blocks away and drag some chairs up to the third floor balcony so that we could sit and watch the music 
with all of the people and realize that this was exactly the reason we moved here, as frustrating as it might have been. In the years following, we purchased a home, we had children, and I was honored to begin serving on Borough Council and with our volunteer fire company and with other organizations in the borough. In many ways, of, of the, you know, all the candidates here at the table, I've been serving in public office for almost eight years. Uh, I'm a bit of a known quantity. I have to imagine, I see people actually watch the Facebook, which is very encouraging to me as a sign of community spirit. So I won't go on and on about what I feel are my accomplishments in the last eight years. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the future. I learned a lot in that time, and what I'm really hoping that we can do in the next four years as a council is continue to drive in a direction where the borough government can operate as a 21st century, nimble, lean, fast-moving organization that responds to the needs of the citizens, that understands uh, that times are changing, and they're changing increasingly at an accelerating pace, uh, that old ideas are uh, the reason we moved here. So how can we model them and then reimagine them in a template for the future? I hope that in doing so, we can also establish clear goals and metrics by which the government can be judged so that we know whether we are succeeding or not. All of this might sound a little dry, heavy on jargon. Whenever I'm making a decision for the borough, I just ask myself one question. Is this best for Narberth as a whole? I know that no matter how difficult or controversial the decision at the table is, that answering that will lead to the best, most honest result. With that, I ask for your support to continue. Thank you. Hi, thank you all for taking time out of your evening to come here today. I cannot count the amount of people that after the primary said to me, are you crazy? Or boy, you are brave. And after enough people say that, it really makes you wonder what, what you just did. Uh, so I'd like to take time now just to really kind of throw my cards on the table. I've met many of you, you watched the last forum, you've seen our web presence. And I just want to reiterate that I'm really happy to volunteer my time here as a council member. And I think that I have some skills that might be useful. I also recognize that I have a learning curve. Uh, I ask you to please remember this is a volunteer position and one that I hope we will share. Uh, Bob Weisbord years ago said to me, I think every single person should be on council because you learn so much about the civic process and your neighbors. And I can tell you I have done that in the last six months during, during the primary time as well. So where do I stand? Briefly, my current borough priorities include one, public safety. Um, as many of you know, I'm a professor of criminology, and this is one aspect that I really do feel as if I could contribute to our town. I would like to see us establish a 21st century police force that's visible, that partners with council. We have an opportunity to really develop our police into a force that is a model for other communities. Moving from a law enforcement model to really one of public safety that meets a borough like ours. Additionally, I look forward to a new budget, um, one that has room for strategic capital improvements, builds upon the work of both Sean and Charlie's great work during his tenure on Borough Council. Additionally, I am eager to support business owners um, and conversations about what retail looks like, not only in America, but clearly here in our small town, Narberth, um, and how do we support economic development from that council table. And lastly, it's important to me that we look at our town through our neighbors' lifespan. Different ages and wages. To Susan, to your point, it's incredibly important to have the voices of the young, the families, um, and our seniors. We have a wonderful momentum here in our town under the leadership of our council, and I, I hope to be part of that to create change. If elected, I will be open-minded and assume good intent, and I would ask that you do the same. I don't have all the answers, but I do deeply respect the civic process and engagement of our community members. I will likely uh, continue to yell at drivers on Iona. Um, I will wear a Viking helmet and run around our town, and will uh, happily dress up as Carolyn Pratchett until Ed Ridley fires <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, I had some prepared remarks, 
but I thought that I would just talk to you instead, so I left them at home with my daughter. Uh, my name is Jim Nixon. I want to represent you on Borough Council. I thank the Narborough Civic Association for putting on this wonderful event. Um, I'm really proud to run with Aaron, Cindy, and Michelle, and Andrea and Regina on the Democratic ticket. I'm also really proud of everyone who's running for office right now, everyone who ran in the primary. It takes a lot of guts to put yourself out there, and I have nothing but admiration for all the candidates. Um, after the last forum, sorry, this microphone's kind of messing with me. After the last forum, someone told me I was heavy on facts and I didn't talk about me enough, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my background. I grew up in Ocean City, New Jersey. I came to... Is that just me or is that speaker a little? Okay. Thank you, Aaron. I grew up in Ocean City, New Jersey, and I came here to Narberth um, when my wife and I accidentally walked here from Ardmore in 2006. And we walked around and we're like, what are we doing in Ardmore? It's so much cooler here. Um, so uh, my wife, Christina, got her first apartment here. I went to law school at Rutgers Law Camden. Prior to that, I did a bachelor's and a master's in political science and government at Villanova University. Um, I think that my skills as an appellate attorney, as a litigator, and more than anything else, as a good listener, are things that would make me well suited to serve you on Borough Council. I don't know if any of you remember um, the Frasier show in the 90s, the spinoff of Cheers, and he always said, I'm listening. Um, I'm a better listener than I am talker. I actually practice listening, and I think that's 80% of being on Borough Council. Um, I want to thank my wife, Christina, for being here. Um, we're so proud to raise our baby daughter here. About eight months ago, we uh, gave birth to our firstborn, and we're going to make our home here, and I'm really proud of this community, and I just want you to know that, you know, whatever your political views, whatever your concerns are, I want to represent all of you, and I'll listen to you, and if you give me a chance, and you give me a four years, four-year term, I promise you, I'll make you proud, I'll work hard, and I'll listen to you. Thank you. Okay, let's pass it to Susan. We're now going to do prepared questions, and uh, thank you to those of you who submitted questions. Thank you. Hopefully they'll be pulled out. I have the numbers. I'm going to pull the numbers tonight. The numbers that are, are the questions. So here's what we're going to do. You, you've got 10 minutes to respond to everything. You can comment on questions. You do have to answer the question that's posed to you, but you can answer it in 15 seconds if you like. Okay, first question. On what committees do you want to serve, and do you have any specialized education, training, or experience that qualifies you to serve on a, on a specific committee? Um, yes, I do. Um, I think with my background of property management and business experience, um, I really feel that the property committee would suit me as well as um, public works and, um, and, and economic development. Um, I happen to have managed a lot of the stores in Norbert and the apartments above from the cheese shop factory, or all the way through what's called the cheese shop factory at the time, all the way down to the Petit Patron, which was at one time a shoe repair. And then from the movie theater down to Colleen. Actually, I put her in there as a tenant years ago. So I feel those three would well suit me. And I think um, it would be a, the best way for me to give back to you um, with my education. Thank you. OK. Anybody else? I, 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 I think. That's probably a question that everybody ought to answer about committees, but... Okay. Um, hi. Okay. Uh, well, having served on the zoning hearing board, I think probably it would be logical to say uh, the, the, uh, the uh, zoning building committee. Um, I also know the building code fairly well, so that would be a, a good fit. I think I could make a good contribution there and not have too steep a learning curve. And beyond that, I have to tell you, honestly, I think all the committees right now 
like every single last one is engaged in some really interesting work, like all of them, even finance and administration. Like there's really something uh, pretty amazing going on at every level in borough government where we are um, retooling to be able to manage this firm in a more efficient fashion, and, and that's just happening in every committee. And so I have to say honestly, I could really just take the committee assignment that where I was needed. I'd be really happy to serve on any of them. Okay, Aaron. Thank you. Um, as currently as president of council, I'm not a member of any of the committees. Um, I work closely with each council member, and each council member chairs their own committee um, to kind of cohesively tie them together. There's a certain amount of resources that we have in the borough, so not everything can be the top priority all the time, but it, it's kind of like stitching a fabric. You have to connect all the dots, and I feel like I can bring strength there. Um, and I would hope that when council is, uh, you know, convened on January 2nd, if I am reelected, that they would choose to uh, continue with me as their president. Um, so I can continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would hope to, to uh, be on public safety. Uh, I do teach criminology and have worked with police in a number of different uh, ways throughout my career in the criminal justice field. Uh, but, but more importantly, though, uh, how I teach and what I study looks at community health. Uh, when communities are healthy, uh, you see low crime rate. Uh, and that, that really, that approach of looking at social structures and where police do or do not fit into that, I think is very important not only in public safety to look at some of our issues in policing, but also is a skill set that I hope that I could bring to that table in that you can't really talk about one committee without the effect of others. So if we're talking about policing, that absolutely has to be part of the conversation about our economic development, about our property management, about our finance. Um, so I see myself as a leader in the Public Safety Committee, but also hopefully someone that can help really strategically make those connections um, and facilitate a process of us holistically looking uh, amongst all the committees. Um, I've always been a pinch hitter in my law practice. So I feel that the first thing I would like to do, assuming that I win and that Aaron wins, um, he has my full support, I would sit down with Aaron and say, here's my skill sets, what are the need, and what's a good match that helps everybody the most? But I don't want to dodge the question. Um, if it was left solely to me, I think that my legal background, particularly my appellate background, where I served three years um, as an attorney with the state superior court, um, gives me a background that would be strong for the property committee. I think that it's an issue facing the borough that doesn't get a lot of attention is that we have a lot of deferred maintenance in our buildings, plural. It's a serious issue. It's going to take a lot of money and it's going to take a lot of time. Um, besides that, I also have a strong interest in public works. And again, I think that my legal background would fit nicely with that. But I really would want to objectively look at where my skills are most useful and make a decision thereafter. Thank you. All right, Michelle, you get the next one, at least to begin. What should the relationship be between the mayor and borough council? What kind of working relationship? that it almost seems too obvious to state that the relationship should be one that's very cordial and very open and very cooperative. Uh, we have different spheres of authority, and, um, and, but uh, I think it's just really important to have open lines of communication. Um, certainly, to the extent that the mayor interfaces with the police, then I think that it's very important for uh, the public safety community to have a very open line of communication with the mayor to make sure that um, our police force is being managed and being operated in a way that serves the entire community. Um, mainly, it just needs to be a cooperative one. I'm not sure what else to say beyond that. I think that the last thing you would want to do is have the mayor and council at loggerheads. Um, that could, you know, I mean, just want to all work together to advance the interest of the borough. Anyone else? Yeah, um, very briefly, I think it needs to be a strong relationship. I also think that disagreements are okay and at times healthy. I mean, I have nothing but confidence in our incoming mayor, Andrea Deutsch. I'm a proud supporter. Um, I think it's good when people get along, but even amongst our democratic slate, we don't always 
agree on things as much as I wish we did. So I think that it's important to get along, but I think that in rare instances, the mayor can be a check on a closely held ordinance, and sometimes a little controversy is a healthy thing. Anyone else? Okay, next question on poll number 11 out of the hat. So Aaron, this is for you in the first instance. Over the past, now, this question is old, so over the past 18 months, the borough has spent approximately $100,000 of taxpayer money on engineering studies for projects like the Bioswale and the library terrace that were never funded because the real world bids ended up being much higher than borough council's projected estimates. How would you prevent such wasteful spending in the future? This is one of the submitted questions. Thank you. Great. I voted to end both of those projects. And I was not pleased that we had spent significant dollars on something that did not move forward. I think the fundamental flaw was a process where no one was really sure of the reason the project existed or was moving forward in the first place. It was a lack of community engagement at the beginning that led to an orphan project that sort of developed and, and grew on its own. Um, and ultimately was a waste of money. I think we're making changes to the way that we come to the conclusion that we want to do something. One is putting together a capital plan, long term, including deferred maintenance, so that we know how many dollars are actually available. Rather than asking a consultant to do a project and then finding out what it costs, we know how much money we have to do a project and we scale our dreams to fit our, uh, you know, how much food is on the table. Uh, also, I would add, thank you, I would add that, um, no, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> it's not your fault. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. M Michelle says. Um, yeah, I, the, it's, it's kind of a bugaboo of mine, and, and it's something that we worked on, on the Civic Association where we actually we, we obtained some documents. We, we put those numbers up, up on our website so that people could see, because I think that it's really important for the community to be aware of that. I agree with Aaron's assessment, and I also would add, I am very, very hopeful and optimistic that the committee that is putting together our comprehensive plan is going to do a bang up job in the work. I hope we work really great together with the committee and council, because once we have a really ambitious comprehensive plan in place, it will help us to prioritize and strategize those expenses rather than just sort of saying, oh, let's do this because there's a grant. We'll say, well, does it fit our, our overall strategic plan? Anyone else? I, I yeah, okay. Go ahead. Just needed a moment. Um, the other side of it is the consultants. The consultants that you choose and how you guide and lead those consultants and how you let those consultants know that you're paying attention and that there are metrics by which they will be judged. Uh, I think that under the new administration of the borough and uh, you know my presidency on council, we've tried to really make those definable and to send a message to consultants and years and anyone who's not kind of on the immediate staff that if you are not delivering the results that we like, then we will get someone else. Um, and I think that we have to be bold with that. It's hard because in the municipal world, it's sort of a captured market of a few big consultancies in the various specialties and you're sort of talking to the same people all the time. So to do that, you need to be very clear up front so that you can be professional while at the same time expecting great results. Thank you. Would anyone else like to comment? I will read. Can I ask a question? Sure. How do I know how much time I have left? <laughs> just, yeah, just, just, just ask and we'll tell you. Okay. All right. That was an off the clock question. I don't want to make sure you're going to talk for up to 10 minutes. Right, but I only have a total of 10 minutes. minutes. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, yeah. <laughs> you can tell you, what you happened. Guys are all, you can tell what happened. You've got nine minutes left. Okay, nine right, minutes okay. left. Uh, you know, I think I was someone that was really pretty critical of a lot of the studies that have been done over the years. Um, it really was a traffic study that inspired me to run that was done 13 years ago and then never put to use. Um, that I felt was just a misappropriation of our tax dollars. Um, I think I was loud and obnoxious and I was placated with a traffic study that cost you all $12,000. Um, so I have been really acutely aware of how we're spending the, spending those dollars. So 
Uh, just briefly, I think we have a tremendous amount of resource and intellectual knowledge and tools of community members that are interested in being engaged, where if we can strategically lean on these boards and commissions to help inform council for us to really strategically understand when do we invest. I was critical of the parking study because I felt like we had the in-house skills now with Sean and Matt to, to, do, to do this study well. Um, and then I saw the study, it was done really well. And the, the reality is, Sean and Matt, I think, just don't have the bandwidth to have done that study. So perhaps we, we, we look at, if we really are a community that needs outside experts, do we reinvest maybe in more personnel? So there is a larger bandwidth. And I don't know the answer to that, but as someone who has cited some frustration um, with things like the bios rail or with the library or with the parking studies, um, I'm acutely aware of the issue. Okay, Drew, number 19, so you get to answer this one soon. Okay, if it's on Granny Pods, I got it. It is, okay. I, it, it is not the Granny Pod question, okay. although that is, that is here. Which is disappointing, because oh, no. I now have an answer, but all right. Well, you, you will get an opportunity okay. in all likelihood. Got it. Okay, what, if any, part of the form-based zoning code do you favor changing? Oh my goodness, this is a Michelle question. Um, I seek to, uh, form based coding is absolutely the one area where, while I have it printed in front of me, and I look, I really actually do, I walk around with it, um, and I look at it often, and then I often call Michelle and say, can you talk to me about this and let me learn more? Um, I, I think, knowing that this is part of my learning curve, I also understand that there are things that are really great and have secured our community so we don't see um, unwanted development or density issues, but I also recognize that there are some holes that I hope that this is fluid and that collectively uh, we, we can look to see what is working and what needs to be adjusted in the future. Would anyone else like to answer? Susan? Jen? What's the order we'll, let, we'll let Jen go first, then Susan. Um, I was a supporter of the form based zoning code, and I still, in fact, I came out um, after talking with a good friend of mine, Jim Spear, who helped draft it. Um, I, I supported it when it was up for council, and it passed unanimously 7 to 0 from all members of council. And I support it now, and I think that one of the beauties of the code is that you've seen a screeching halt to teardowns, and that makes me really proud. I've also heard from a lot of people, especially people on the south side, that there's things in their neighborhood that they don't like. And like any legal document, I'm not a strict constructionist. I think it's a living, breathing document, and I am extremely open to having a candid and honest conversation with anyone who has a problem with how this affects their neighborhood to improve it and make it work for more people. Susan? Well, Jim almost like, said exactly what I was going to say, but um, I was very apprehensive about the four based zoning code. Um, I've begun to appreciate it. Um, I think it is covering um, and going to be securing a lot of our buildings and landscape moving forward in the future. Um, I am concerned about several things that are still being worked on. I um, commend the, um, uh, the Planning Commission and the Building Zoning Committee um, that I've attended numerous meetings and they are working with our concerns moving forward. Um, I'm concerned about the increasing of density um, and um, in certain areas um, in Yarmouth. And I think we have to remember this, this form-based zoning code just doesn't takes care of one specific area. Norbert is a big, broad, beautiful area that is divided into little divisions, little sections. It's always been that way. And the form-based zoning code may not match that particular section's needs. And I think that's where we still need to be vigilant and be aware that this is just not going to be the catch-all for everything. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, we're, we're back to Susan for the for question. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Jim. One, two, three, four. <laughs> I remember. I'm old enough to remember that. I'm not. 
All right, what issues do you think could benefit from more inf input from the public, and how would you improve borough communication with the public? Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to go back to my issue of deferred maintenance. Governments in the United States, from the borough level to the municipality level larger, like Lower Marion, to the county level, to the state, and to the Fed, have operated under the past 100 years at an assumed growth rate of high single digits to perhaps double digits. If the past decade has taught us anything, it's that it's probably not going to come back. But our governments, even our little government here in Narber, has been running on that model for decades and decades. Before, when my, when my dad was in Vietnam, that's how Narber operated. And I think it's, we, governments live paycheck to paycheck. So how does this affect Narber? We have a serious deferred maintenance issue. If you look around Borough Hall, and I love this building, but if you really pay attention, and I encourage you, if you haven't, to come in here, check out New Horizons and look around, there's a lot of maintenance needs. We own a building on Sabine Avenue that needs potentially millions of dollars of work. This is something that's going to happen, and we're all going to have to face it, and we're going to have to decide how to pay for it. So if I'm your councilman, I want to know how you would like to face that challenge together, because it's your money. Anyone else? Aaron. Sure. I think that I have high hopes for what the borough can do in terms of communication with the citizens that's outbound, but that's also when people come in with a question where they have a problem and they need that to be dealt with. And uh, I think I've been very upfront in the past few months that I do not feel our borough government is currently where it needs to be. In fact, I think from the perspective of most people, uh, in the past two years it has taken a step backwards. That is part of a strategy to spend more time working on long-term, high-level, value-added plans. And the, what, there's only so many hours in the day. We only have so much staff, so we had to make a decision. My hope is, is that we go through a trough, and then we put these pieces in place, like our new website, like our uh, internal trackers for issues and items, and we can come out so that we can use technology in a way that it takes so much less time to do so much more communication. I wish it could happen faster and sooner, but I think a little pain now will help us for 20 or 30 years down the road. Anyone else? Okay, we're back to you, Susan. Question nine. What is your understanding of the parking study, and what do you think ought to be done as a result of that parking study? Wow, I didn't get the granny pod question. That would have been easier. <laughs> Um, the parking study. I was here for the presentation. Um, I'm a little concerned um, that the company that actually did the parking study was from Boston. And I really would have liked to have seen maybe a local company do it to really understand our, our needs and concerns um, here in Narberth. Um, we're, new, we're unique. I don't think we're the norm. Um, the recommendations um, didn't feel real comfortable with them as well. Um, maybe when the council goes through those recommendations and develops them and breaks them down into what would be suitable for this town, um, it would work. Um, I'm not even sure how the initial, I, I believe the initial study that was asked for was regarding the parking over on, um, in a specific part of town regarding mixed use or going residential. I mean, going commercial, rather. Um, so I'm not quite sure if this even pinpointed the original answer of what um, the citizens were asking. So I'm hoping it will help. So my understanding of the parking study and its purpose was to comprehensively evaluate parking borough-wide. Um, and so we would understand how the effects in one part, how parking in one area of the borough can affect parking in another area, in another area, in another area. And I think that, that that's exactly what I believe they were tasked with, and I think that's what they did. My understanding of the results is that um, my, my takeaway was sort of twofold. One, that we, we have sufficient parking in the borough. 
overall, but we have some hot spots where we have parking challenges. And that was number one. And number two is that the regulations that we have for parking in place now have been developed over many years in a piecemeal fashion, um, not in a comprehensive fashion. So sometimes what we have is a restriction in one area that's causing you know, bleed over problems into another area. And so that if we take a comprehensive approach to parking in the borough, I don't think we have a problem that's at all beyond our ability to, to address. Um, that's my takeaway. And how I would like to see it implemented is um, not in isolation, but hand in hand with an analysis of traffic safety, and even if we can manage to stretch it, uh, bicycle and, and pedestrian safety in the borough as well, I would like to see our solutions be uh, manifold that way. I think if we only address parking, we may end up uh, with a similar with a similar problem where we, we've addressed one problem, but, but we still have traffic safety issues and, and our parking solutions have made those traffic safety issues worse. So I want to see us take a comprehensive view of, of all of our transportation-related uh, issues, which include, include the parking recommendations. Anyone else? Um, we bought two things with that study. We bought data. That is an analysis of the parking in the borough, different days of the week, different times of day. Why is it important? Because unless we have data, a common data set that we can agree on, we'll be arguing about anecdotes until the end of time, and we'll never make any progress. The second thing we purchased was a toolbox, a set of strategies of different ways of dealing with parking and their influence on traffic calming. Now it's council's job, or perhaps a working group, or a community group, to come and take those tools and try and figure out how we build the Legos to make a parking strategy for our town. And I have to be honest, I'm really looking forward to it. And if you thought that the form-based zoning code was controversial, <laughs> just wait, because Nothing aggravates any of us more than parking. You, you mean the, the, the five dollar space on Hanford Avenue in front of the Greeks? <laughs> it's in there. I know it's in there. That community debate is going to be very good for our community because all of those ideas will swirl together to come up with what can't be the best solution for any of us right in front of our home but will be the best solution for this town as a whole. And what helps the town as a whole ultimately feeds back into benefit for us. So please try and keep that in mind. Stay positive. <laughs> so I'm not going to repeat what Michelle and Aaron said, but, but I agree very much. And um, it's interesting, Susan, I think we looked at the external kind of outside carpet study differently. I actually appreciated that the group was from Boston because I thought really you have someone coming with truly an objective perspective that doesn't know our town and I thought maybe that would perhaps give them a clearer vision if, if they didn't know us in our, our community. And I really was pleasantly surprised with the data and the toolkit. My only comment is as campusing uh, particularly on the south side, which is Aaron and I knocked on many of doors, we would say, what do you love about Narberth? What's your biggest frustration? And nine times out of ten, it was parking. Uh, what, a, what a privilege and luxury for our top community issue intention to be parking. And I, and I don't mean to, to sound luxury or preachy or entitled, but it gave me pause to think, Wow, nine out of ten times, folks that said, God, I don't want to park two cars in my driveway because when my husband's watching TV, it means he has to you know, get up and switch cars. And I said, what if your neighbor came to you and said, I understand that's an inconvenience, but I don't have a driveway and I have a young child, and wow, it'd be really nice if I could park in front of my house. And nine out of ten neighbors said, oh gosh, of course. Then I would use my driveway for two spots. And it really made me think, perhaps before we go, to consultants or large strategies. Maybe what we do best in Narberth is be neighbors. And sometimes just saying, I know it's pain, but do you mind I don't have a driveway? That perhaps that's a first entry level to look at an otherwise really great comprehensive plan and all the things that you said. Um, but when I look at the news in the world, I think, God, aren't we privileged to have a, a really a parking issue? <laughs> Um, I look at all the uh, Facebook groups in Bernard Earth. I don't comment much. I don't like much. 
but um, I pay attention. And when I first saw the cost of the parking study, I can't repeat what came out of my mouth. Um, and I was against it. I mean, I didn't call anybody. I wasn't on council, but I thought, no way. Um, then I went to some of the presentations and I read the study. And um, I think I might have voted for it. And now that we spent the money, I think we better gosh darn well make use of that study. I mean, we spent about $75,000 of our taxpayer dollars on that. Let's put it to good use. One thing that I liked about the study, it talked about having zones. For example, I live on Williams Avenue. If my neighbor has a blowout party and I have to park a meeting house, technically I can get a ticket because your stickers are currently designated for your street. But the parking study, one recommendation that I liked was zones. And those zones are not established yet. That's something we're gonna have to work on. But maybe I could park a block and a half away and I don't have to call the borough and explain to Sean or leave a voicemail to say, I need to park my car. Also, when I went door to door, um, people's concerns were parking and pedestrian safety. I sat down and had a long discussion about this with the Secretary of Transportation for Pennsylvania, Leslie Richards, who has offered to send to Narberth in January or February a representative from PennDOT who is willing to work with council and the community and the parking study so we can best implement this in a way that makes sense for everybody. Anyone else? I think that is everyone. Okay. The, the, let's see, that was, that was Susan, so it's Michelle's turn. Okay, you get number 10. The, Police pension fund was inadequately funded over multiple budget years, and a substantial catch-up contribution of about $100,000 was included in the 2017 budget. In the future, how would you ensure Narberth protects its police retirement security? How would you prevent such a catch-up from having to occur in the future? Um, well, I think, I think the most important thing we need to, to do is listen to our police pension fund trustees and meet with them and have open lines of communication because they, they, will, they will give us advice and I think that that there is if I I, I was not on council and I, I'm not sure if this is accurate but it may be the case that they had attempted there had been some attempts to flag the issue that didn't quite make it up the totem pole so I think communication is a big part of that um, and I think if we do that and we make so therefore we make reasonable assumptions about rate of, rates of return and we continue to fund it um, in, a, in an informed way based on data that, that, that's realistic, then I, I don't think we should find ourselves in this position again. Anyone else? I'll just, yeah. add, I'll just add to that, uh, not the question that usually comes up. Uh, we have a, a dream team on our police pension trustees, and that just speaks to the, the knowledge base in this community, and it's really fantastic. Um, I think everyone, who works in the financial industry recognizes that the past, um, coming up on nine years, have been one of historically low interest rate returns. Um, they are limited in what they can invest in, because it's a pension fund. And um, I think while there were you know, some communication issues, uh, nobody expected interest rates to stay so low for so long. We made our catch up. We made significant revisions to our expectations for future years. And I was very encouraged that council felt empowered to make that catch-up contribution a very, as strongly as it needed to be, the amount of dollars that it needed to be right now. Because as a, any kind of course correction, the more you can do right now saves this community down the road. And we did that, and hopefully it will not happen again. Um, if interest rates go negative, I don't know what we can do. Anyone else? Jim? Jim wants to make a quick point. Just to add, echo what Aaron just said, I mean, if you follow um, the economics that are going on today, there's a strong chance rates may stay low for the foreseeable future. And this is an unfunded liability, and I think council should be applauded for taking steps to catch up, because it's been underfunded chronically for decades. Um, to make an analogy, it's like having a credit card balance that you're paying interest on. The reality is the borough is legally obligated to pay this fund. We owe the money, we're still behind. So the sooner we play catch up, the less pain there'll be for all Northworth residents. And it comes back to being good financial stewards. 
Anyone else? Okay, Aaron, this one's for you, and this is sort of a, a twofold question. It's it's going to be addressed to the Democratic candidates, and the adjunct is going to be addressed to Susan. So the question is, could each of you on the Democratic slate please give an example of an area or two in which your viewpoints, platform, or voting patterns will differ from the rest of the slate? In other words, what distinguishes you from your running mates? Please be specific. And then for Susan, what policy positions distinguish you from the Democratic Party candidates for borough council? I gotta say, that's a tough one. And I think Susan's gonna have a hard time. I don't wanna speak for her. She's making a face. Um, <laughs> we, we've got it on video. I, I, you know, wow. the four of us are members of the Democratic Party. For me, local politics has very little to do with Democratic Party positions. Um, maybe it speaks to a philosophy of life, maybe it speaks to an outlook, how I choose to identify. But the decisions I make for the borough are based on data. Um, they're based on what's, what's best for Narberth overall, as I said in my opening statement. Um, I'd have to go back through the record and see, you know, for example, um, I think Sam Quinn and I differed about the, the time that should be for a curfew for the parks. One of the few times we disagreed does it have anything to do with Democratic Party values? I'm, I'm not sure. So, that's all I got. I was hoping you were going to talk longer so I could think what I, I said. I'd like to do that too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, well, since this is a newly formulated party, um, Norbert Voices, and an independent party, um, policy, <coughs> not necessarily so. But just the fact that we felt that it was important to be able to have everybody's voices heard in this election this year. There hasn't been. It's been uncontested since 2006, these races. Um, I also feel that I might be straying from the question because it's rather difficult. Um, I think a lot of it also has to do with me personally being um, a lifelong um, Norbeth resident, who has a passion for Norbeth, not that these people don't, but I think there's a history. I think I can add to decision making, not going forward with changes, but just going through, you know, um, going to the past and seeing how things had happened before. Um, I think that um, Norbeth Voices is a party that's consumed with wonderful things so far as um, civic pride, volunteerism, going back to some of the roots and moving forward. I don't know if this answered the question correctly, but that's the way I feel. Okay. Thank you. Cindy? So I agree. I think that there's a lot of policy that we would all, the four of us, the five of us, would all agree on. So really, you're looking at what what skills and what personalities do people bring to the table. And I think the Narberth together, the four of us are all very different. We have very different careers. We have very different personalities and skill sets. Like I say, my strength is not zoning. I look to Michelle. I look to Aaron for process and a global perspective. I look to Jim, who is deeply rooted in a macro. Uh, a macro picture of where Narberth is positioned to leverage resources and benefits from the larger county and state. Uh, I think I bring a piece to the pie with public safety and, and how I just build pathways to other groups. Um, Susan is a friend of mine. We sat at her table and we both disagreed on the outcome of that church. And we both said, oh yeah, I see your point, I disagree. You see my point, I disagree. That can happen. And I've said before, I think it should be rare that they're seven to zero. To Jim's point, sometimes respectful dialogue and objections are healthy because the truth arises. Now this is not to say having someone who's just an obstructionist is healthy or helpful, because I don't, I don't think that's the case. But I think I speak for the five of us in that we all respect one another's position we respect that we ran and volunteered, and that those differences are only going to help Narberth in the end. Thanks. Um, as a Democratic leader in town, I'm going to try and hit that question head on. Um, politics aren't popular. If I wanted to be popular, I, 
I will give up one. I love politics, and I love democratic politics. Um, we just had the most contested primary in probably a few decades. I think that anyone who, who knows the four of us, and I'm sure Susan would agree with this, that we do not bring, we don't agree. In fact, we disagree, I'd say half as much as we agree. But as far as the party role, for what it's worth, I think it's about values, and I think that that is the purpose that it serves. And without taking us too astray into national politics, I do think it's a very good time to be a Democrat. I can't point to any specific issue where I will or will not agree with Cindy, Aaron, Michelle, Susan, or anybody, but I can tell you that outside of values, I think that most of Narberth issues are not partisan. And I think that once we're in that room, whoever we may be, I may or may not be part of that group, I don't think anyone uses party values to make non-partisan decisions. Okay, let's see, we're, we're Aaron, yes? Did, oh. Did, okay, thank you, Sandy. Okay, what is your understanding about New Horizons and the services it provides? What, if anything, do you think Borough Council should do to keep New Horizons in Narberth? I, as I mentioned in my opening, um, I'm in, incredibly interested in looking at the lifespan of our residents. Um, and I think New Horizons is an incredible resource to support seniors in our community. Um, I was actually here at their, their volunteer luncheon in June, and it's a magical place. I mean, this room is really transformed into a community of wealth of stories and energy and a lived history of our town and surrounding towns. And I think council has an obligation to look at whether it's the park and is it safely accessible to folks who are seniors or have a disability, to is the space safe um, for seniors to feel welcome and have regular programming. There is a property on Sabine Avenue that we're all going to have to take a hard look at what that use will be in our community. And I do truly hope that we can consider having New Horizons have a stable, safe space uh, in our town. I think they're a tremendous resource. Um, <clears throat> early in this campaign, I spent several hours at New Horizons I'm with the director and I had a nice conversation with Georgette and I listened to their concerns, and if I had to distill them to one sentence, they said, we want a home. Having New Horizons come into Borough Hall, set up, and take down every day, I don't think it's good for this building. I don't think it's good for New Horizons. I think it's a very short-term uh, answer to a long-term issue. And I think that we need, I promise New Horizons this, that we need to have a serious discussion about what, our, if we're, we either need to give New Horizons a home or they need to look elsewhere. And that's the honest answer. And I think that we ought to sit down with them and see if we can help them. It's something that I'm open to. And I wouldn't have spent a few hours with them if I didn't feel that way. It's something that I'm, I'm committed to doing. I'm committed to that dialogue. Anyone else? Susan. I've been an advocate for New Horizons for a number of years, and it is imperative that we try to find a place for them here. I don't know how that, that's going to work. Um, the people, the aging residents in Norwich need a place to go, they need a place to call home. Um, I think it's important that they can be, get a good meal there, I think they can, get, they can be involved in classes. Um, I also believe that there are a lot of um, older residents that actually do volunteer work, not only are they participating, but they're also volunteering there. It's giving them a purpose. A lot of you are younger, where maybe you won't quite grasp the fact yet that we look forward to these, these programs, the Tai Chi, the yoga. Um, it gives them a purpose. Um, I don't want that part of our um, Norbert community to um, be neglected and to be faltered upon. So, yeah, I don't. I don't want to just repeat what everybody said, but I, I concur. And um, what I, I think that New Horizons has been um, in temporary quarters for far too long. But I don't have a solution to put forward, and I'm kind of a solution-oriented person, and it frustrates me when I don't see a solution. But I concur absolutely that I would like to see New Horizons have a home, have a permanent home. I would like to see our seniors have a place. 
that they come to, that they, that they feel safe in, that they call home, where they're more engaged uh, in our community, in a, in, a, in a more central location, and in, in, a, in a location that's easier to access. Uh, and I wish I had a solution to put forward. I always feel terrible when I don't have an answer. But I know that on a council, it's something I would absolutely support and look at and, uh, and hope that that's something that we can resolve in the next few years. I, mean, I think it's, it's long overdue. In addition to the volunteer spirit that I love about Narber, the fact that it can be a walkable community for people of all ages throughout their entire lifespan is important to me. Um, that it's affordable to people in all stages of their life is important to me. And we've taken various steps over the years on council to do what we can to keep nudging the ball in that direction, even as uh, the economic forces of real estate have driven up home values considerably. When New Horizons was uh, in search of a home, I want to you know, commend Bill Martin, who was borough manager at the time, because it wasn't even a question that we would have a home for them here in the borough hall, and council uh, enthusiastically supported that. Where do they go for a permanent home? Where do they go now? Leads to the question of what kind of community spaces do we need in the borough? How much? There's been a lot of community space lost as churches have closed and organizations and groups that use their halls and their, their um, banquet areas um, had nowhere to meet. And that's a conversation I would like to have over the next four years. How can we continue to support a great volunteer spirit, a community with so many different activities and events with a shrinking footprint of places to put them? And um, we do have a building at 201 Sabine. We also have the two wings alongside the library. And we have opportunities to rethink and reimagine how those spaces can be used uh, to the benefit of everybody, including seniors. Thank you. OK. Uh, Cindy, did, you did the last one, right? Something OK. Jim, this one's for you. Brady uh, Bunch? No, no, the granny plots has some power. Uh, what should the relationship be between Norberth and Lower Marion Township? What are your plans to Im improve this relationship? I love this question. Uh, we are so I, much. I don't particularly. <laughs> we're, we are so much stronger dealing and with and getting along with Lower Marion than we are in the opposite direction. There have been many instances since uh, before I got to Narberth where we have rubbed heads, bumped heads with them. They're larger than us, they have more money than we do, and they completely surround the borough. We need them. But the reality is they need us. They want to work with us. We make, we make Lower Marion look good. We have better voter turnout. We have better activities. We're a more walkable community. I think that we could be a real centerpiece for them. So how I would like to address that is I would like to establish a more ongoing dialogue with several of the Lower Marion commissioners. And I can say that for myself, and I know I'm not the only one at the table, but I have very good relationships with at least half of the Montgomery, the Montgomery, the Lower Marion commissioners. And that's a relationship I think we could foster. So many reasons to do that, I couldn't even possibly name them all. Police, education, joint civic activities, the, the list goes on, but we need to work with them as closely as possible. Anyone else? How much time do we have? Uh, we're, are, are we ditching the 10 minutes? You're, you are doing, you are all <laughs> doing really well. Do you want to give them updates? Yeah, yeah. We, 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 you all have at least, at least two minutes apiece. So, and, and we're probably going to end this in the next 10 okay. minutes. So. Then I'm just going to say, I agree with Jim, this is where his skill, you just perfectly demonstrated it, um, in that we need to get along. Uh, we share schools, we share places, we start sharpening, we're neighbors that uh, we need to, to, to definitely facilitate a positive relationship there. When I came onto council, uh, we were in the middle of being sued by the school district, so in a sense we were suing ourselves. And one of uh, the things that I'll carry with me whenever my public service ends is the ability to negotiate. That I sat at the table and negotiated the end to that dispute. Um, it was very obvious to me that it was all because of misunderstanding, because of a lack of a close personal relationship between elected officials 
in overlapping but competing districts. And I didn't want to ever see that happen again. I mean, it's a waste of money for everybody and pain and suffering you know, and frustration. Um, the Intergovernmental Council was reconvened uh, a few years ago. Uh, that is where Lower Marion commissioners, school district uh, board members, and Narberth council members sit at the table three times a year. We discuss our issues. We get to know each other. We trade cell phone numbers. We get used to texting each other. It's that soft stuff. So when something comes up, it doesn't become spiral, spiral Facebook. It's a text and it's done. And I would like to continue to develop that and I hope, uh, you know, one way or another, there's gonna be three new council members at the table. Um, and I think that, or maybe four new council members. Good. Oh, awesome. yeah. Uh, no. No, he forgot about himself. Come on. I'm trying to do math on the fly. Anyway, uh, that they, they, they have opportunities to develop those relationships. It, those are the things where a chance meeting at a mixer goes a long way 10 years from now when there's a disagreement. hope we always remember that we want to stay independent. Obviously, that's the thread that runs through my theme, that, um, that we can still become, stay, and um, continue to be this wonderful independent town that we have. We do need them for schools. We do need them for our police. I understand. Um, but we have to remember that we are Yarmouth, and our civic pride, and the small borough that we are keeps us unique. Okay, next question. Let's see, we're back to Susan. You guys are really doing well time-wise. I like, I like the way this worked out. Okay, what should the relationship of the borough, borough council, and the food bank be? C3 organization. The borough supports a number of 501c3 organizations and there's a process in place by which they submit their budgets and their records and they uh, make a request for funding and the reason for the funding and then council decides on whether uh, you know some funding is offered to them. Number of ambulance, New Horizons, um, there's a couple others, they're all in the budget. I think that's the process. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think, I said this when the food bank was under attack a few months ago, um, that you can, if somebody much wiser than I said, you can judge a society by how it treats the most vulnerable among us. And I'm a Pope Francis Catholic, and I think it's a great thing for Narberth that we have somewhere our residents can go if they're facing a crisis that, you know, something, I've, I've never been hungry, I mean, look at me. But, you know, bad joke, but it's important. I've never had food security, and I can't imagine what it's like for families. I know the food bank pays a lot of rent, and I know that the issues with their regulatory problems were made big headlines a few months ago, and I think it's a shame that the same headlines didn't happen to make it to the front page, and that's just the way news works, that 
All of that has essentially been resolved. The food bank has paid its rent. And also to echo what, what a few people have said, while I support the food bank and I think it's great for Narber, right now the relationship is that of a landlord and a tenant. We have a tenant, they pay their rent, and I think it's a mutually beneficial relationship for both parties. Anyone else? Okay, we're at, we're at 820. We've done really well. I think we're gonna take our break a little bit early. Uh, and we will reconvene with floor with questions from the floor at eight thirty sharp. One thing I want uh, to say. Uh, go ahead. Interesting. It reminded me, and I forgot to say that if you didn't get to sign up for the email list for the Narbert Civic Association, there are sheets over there, and Andreas is hanging over, and so feel free to sign up, and you'll get our emails. We don't do lots of that, but we send out important things, so you might want to be aware of what's going on that way. Thanks. All right. Take 10. You guys did, did well. <laughs> that's right. 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 That's right.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, if we can uh, get started, perhaps we'll even have a early night. You guys did you guys did real well in managing time, by the way. Some of you were close to the town, others not so much, but we're working. Well, actually, you can, you can look at the stats. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the floor is going to be open, and I'm going to tell you what the uh, what the what the format is going to be. Uh, you get to ask any candidate any question that you want, as long as it's polite, of course. Uh, and those candidates will have one minute to answer the question. Other people will have a minute to comment, and. Uh, We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, so we will, and up here for the candidates, we will let you know when you've got 30 seconds to go, and we will let you know when to stop, because we're going to time for a minute. So if you have a question, come on up and use this mic. And come on up. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jesse Lytle, I live on 108 South Norworth Ave, uh, and my question is about climate change. Um, so, uh, I think climate change is the defining challenge of this generation, and certainly my kids' generation, and I think most of the most important action is happening at the municipal and state level these days. So I'd like uh, to hear what you think Norbert's role is in confronting this existential crisis. Who starts that, Rich? Okay, do, did you want to address that's, it? That's a general question. Anybody, I just teed it up. Anybody can take a swing at it. All right. <laughs> I'd love that question. Go ahead. You should take it. <laughs> um, on my list of top three issues in life, as far as political issues, I would put climate change, if not one, darn near close. Um, it threatens our way of life. It threatens the future of billions, and I don't want to sound like Trump and say billions too much, but it threatens the future of billions of human beings. And it's something that governments are failing to adequately address. Um, it's something that Pope Francis talks about in the Vatican. It's something that our prior president talked about greatly, and we're taking a great leap backwards. I think that local governments in this political climate have a unique opportunity to take the lead on being green a little bit at a time. It's kind of like losing weight. If you look at the 100 pounds or 50 pounds, you just give up. We have to make small changes every day together to move in the right direction. And we also have to stop looking at it between money and the environment as if they're mutually exclusive. Because jobs without an environment doesn't work and a country with unemployed people doesn't work. Narberth needs to take the lead on that, and I look for any way, any way to engage our government to effectuate real climate change solutions. Send in. Yeah, take, take them on. Whoever wants, whoever wants to respond can respond. I think this is a great example of, there you are, I think this is a great example of uh, something that should be a Narberth value, right? We need to say as a community that we are committed to being good stewards of our earth, both here in Narberth, uh, locally and globally. And to do that then, we're gonna take that lens and look at every single committee and say, how are you a good steward of our earth? So when you are in public works, you are looking with an environmental lens. When you are the rec board and you're talking about the, the playing fields flooding and uh, water, rain runoff, you are looking with an environmental lens. Our policing should be looking with an environmental lens. How do we encourage through economic development for our lovely restaurants and pubs to move from styrofoam to those, uh, those resources that can be recycled? I would hope that we really as a community embrace a commitment to climate change and then use that lens on every single committee and every single board. I'll just say, we talked a lot about deferred maintenance. That means we're going to be doing a lot of construction work, and there are choices to be made in the design, as well as who we choose to implement, and the materials that we implement with. Um, and we can make uh, climate change conscious choices for all of those decisions. I think that's the most actionable thing in front of us. Last night was a council discussion. 
about moving to LED streetlights, and that now may be the time. Well, that has a significant impact because that electricity right now is coming from coal and natural gas. Anyone else? Okay, next question. Step on up. Come on up. They're not going to hear you if you don't speak to them. Thanks. Um, I'm Greg Harper. Uh, my wife, Lori, and I are new seniors to Narberth uh, with two children, two daughters, and five grandchildren in Marion Station. We're here for all the reasons you guys have talked about. So, um, but we're also new, so we don't have a lot of history. I understand that the Main Street thing is coming up in November. Can you take in your minute and just say one thing about that project that you think is important for us going forward? The, the Main Street? Yeah, the whole, the whole Downtown development issue. You know, Mapes is gone, Ricklands is vulnerable. And these are one of the reasons we're here. So I, I just want to get a sense are you willing to say something, even, even though we haven't seen the report and we don't know what's being presented? On top of mind. Sure. Yeah, well, first of all, welcome to Narberth and thank you so much for coming out here. It's really exciting to see the residents who are uh, energized and engaged and want to come out and be part of the process. So, welcome. And uh, thanks for the question. I think it's a really important question. Um, this economic development issue is really important to me. It's one I talk about a lot um, for a number of reasons, one of which when I was running in the primary and I was going door to the door, probably the, the issue that I heard most of, the, I heard two issues most often, one was pedestrian safety and the other was people were really worried about what will happen to the downtown with some of our key stores closing, some of our key stores are kind of obviously coming to the you know, American family market, uh, Ricklands now operating under a lease. And, um, you know, our downtown is something that is so important to our cohesiveness as a community. And um, it is thriving pretty well on its own, but I think it would be a mistake to take that for granted. So I think I encourage you to come to the meeting on the 30th. It's not going to be a presentation of like, oh, this is what we're going to do. It's really the first baby step in the process to see, really to take the temperature of the community and see what people are willing to do, what people want to see happen in the downtown. So I'm going to come to the meeting. Would you repeat the date, please? November 30th. Flyers. 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 I have flyers for the meeting. Kim Neff has flyers. She will give you a flyer. <laughs> she has a stop sign, too. Susan? Um, the downtown business district has always been the heart and soul of Norbert for decades. Um, it wasn't always quite as nice as it is now, that's for sure. But um, I think um, I'm excited about um, hearing what um, Main Street America has to say moving forward. Um, it is a data type situation from what I understand. I don't think it's going to be a quick fix. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing what we can do. I think we're doing okay now, but like you said, when those anchor stores go out, I think we're right in front of some problems being the American family and Ricklands, and of course, um, it was sad to see Mapes go. Uh, my business, I sell a consumer product, and so my customers are retailers. That gives me a little bit of insight on a professional level into what's happening in retail. And if you, if I ask you what's the headline for retail, the answer is the death of retail. But more retail stores opened in the United States last year than closed. So that seems strange. What's happening is, is it's really about change and what is the future and are businesses that are just supplying product versus supplying experiences or supplying something unique or something with a personal touch, what's gonna to be successful in the future? What I'm hoping we can do through this project is be at the forefront of what the future of retail is going to become. We have two retail areas in this town, Montgomery Avenue, which has a number of shuttered businesses that have been sitting for years and years. And then we have this one off the beaten path that nobody knows about that's thriving. It's totally upside down from any consultant's background experience. We're gonna to get to the bottom of it and make it better. Two brief comments. The first is I would like council to utilize form-based zoning to really hold businesses accountable that really aren't true to that retail space. Um, I think there's a couple examples on that. Um, on Haverford Ave that, that folks need to be held accountable. 
I have uh, been um, skeptical of the match of Main Street. Kim, I know you and I are, are having conversations about this. I think Donna's model makes a lot of sense in other communities. I don't necessarily believe it is a match for Narberth. And I would hope that council would look at other economic developers that bring a different tool set um, and approach to meet with us here at Narberth before we make any decision to go with this particular consulting firm. My answer is a hybrid between Cindy's and Michelle's. Um, I agree with Cindy that I don't, I'm not sure it's the right fit. When I say I'm not sure, I don't know yet. I want to see what their ideas are. Um, I also, it's a baby step, no matter how you look at it. It's a first step. We have this thriving district, as Aaron said, in the center of town at Haverford Avenue. But when you look at pedestrian, uh, vehicle traffic through the borough of Narberth, and alongside of it, our Montgomery Avenue business corridor, which is shuttered, is disgraceful. And that is Narberth's window to most people outside of Narberth. Thousands and thousands of drivers go by every day, and there are people that aren't pulling in to spend dollars, and there are people that if that's all they know about Narberth, well gosh, we're giving them the wrong, we're giving them the wrong image. So I don't I think that we need a more comprehensive plan that addresses maintaining Haverford Avenue and also addressing the fact that we have a serious problem on our Montgomery Avenue business corridor. Thank, welcome to the neighborhood and thank you for a great question. I happen to be one of the retailers who owns a shop in that downtown busy little district and I love where I am and frankly my business has thrived since I've come to our downtown little district. We, we are facing some upcoming challenges due to the potential retirement of a couple, couple of our major stores. Recently I had a meeting with our congressman, uh, Dwight Evans, and he runs a program that's fascinating. It's called Middle City. And middle cities work with small towns, not the richest of the rich and not the poorest of the poor. The ones that are kind of in the middle, that could use a little encouragement, a little uh, help with development and maintenance. I'd like to work with Congressman Evans and, and see what suggestions he has, as well as with some of our state as well as local uh, officials, including our, our borough council, to see what kind of encouragement we can get in there to, for, to maintain a thriving business district, which uh, is really a heart and soul of Nar of Narberth. Thank you. Next question. Come on up. Okay, this is sort of an awkward question for me. Um, as a lifelong Democrat, I have been so pleased to see Norbert become a majority Democrat. I think each and every one of you up there is a fine person and would do a fine job. My question for you is, what are your concerns about our having a one-party system here in Norbert and what will each of you do to make sure that you hear and give voice to, you know, different opinions that might be out in the community? While keeping us still majority Democratic. <laughs> um, I don't, I've thought about this question a lot, and there's a short-term answer, which is what we have now. A lot of problems come with being a one-party town. It's a relatively new phenomenon to America. Here it's organic, it wasn't designed, we weren't drawn into a district, and I support the Democratic Party. I'm as one of one to ten, I'm an eleven Democrat. But I recognize there's some problems. The real answer is to adopt a borough change that guarantees a seat for a minority party the way that Philadelphia does. Philadelphia has a system wherein no matter if the Republican gets five votes and all the Democrats get five million, they guarantee a certain number of spots to the top vote-getter in the minority party. I'm not sure if it's politically feasible, but it's a discussion we ought to have because there are tools in our laws that would guarantee us a two-party system. And it's like a only Nixon can go to China thing. Only the Democrats can fix that, and it's a conversation I think we need to have next year. As a Democrat, uh, I'm running on the Democratic Party, and I support the general Democratic uh, platform. Uh, I have to say I sat on borough council for a couple of years, and my theory is you get seven Democrats in a room, you get eight opinions. So, so uh, good opinions aren't, don't, have, don't have a party. Good opinions or good ideas are something to be chewed on by everybody. 
And uh, I think in a small town, uh, atmosphere party matters a little bit less than, than uh, on a local, uh, uh, than on a, a wider area. Because local issues are local. I mean, we have to we have to fix our playgrounds. We have to serve our downtowns. We have to fix our budgets. But I think you, I think it's just because we're of the same party does not mean we are homogenous, and doesn't mean we don't come to the table with a lot of different ideas, a lot of different life experiences, and a lot of different uh, backgrounds that will serve this community well. I think that in my time on council, and especially in the president's role, um, I've shown that I value debate, and I value openness and transparency. When we were discussing the form-based zoning code, there were a lot of community concerns. And it was important to me that even if I really disagreed with that concern, that that concern be able to come onto the table, we all have a discussion about it, some parties may not be happy with how that ends up, but at least it had its time in the public sphere to be discussed. On council, I've tried to open up conversations about nominations for boards and committees. I have challenged council to not consider party affiliation when appointing non-elected boards and committee memberships. We have so many people in this community with so many different backgrounds and so much to add. And I think keeping that in everybody's mind helps to keep it open and fair. And also, I'd like to thank Cheryl Allison here from the Mainline Times, because in a one-party town, the one person who doesn't have to answer to anybody is Cheryl. She can write whatever she wants. <laughs> so far. Well, I'm trying to break that mold um, by not just having a one-party system in our council. Um, I think it's important that we have choices. I think it engages citizens. I think if they feel they don't have a choice um, when it comes to um, election time, that they are not going to be engaged in coming out here. They're not going to be engaged in dialogue. They're not going to show interest. Um, and a lot of the, it will just be rumor mill that's going through town instead of the hardcore facts. If they have another party that they feel comfortable with, that they can trust, and that they can um, vote for and have a choice um, I think this is why Norwich Voices was formed for everybody of all affiliations to be able to have a voice. Um, and I think it's so important that we have a two-party system that was, uh, it's what our country was founded on. Why should it stop now? Thank you. Yeah, so just to push back a little bit on the question, Catherine, because I don't, I, I, I really do tend to think that the Party, poli party political division isn't the salient one so much um, in the borough of Norberth. But I do think that we can get into a danger zone where this um, uh, the council all starts to look a little bit too much alike in terms of our life's experience and, um, and, and, and maybe just what we look like and, and just kind of the, the, the general point of view that we bring to the table. And I don't think that that's really a, a party issue. Um, but I would like to see more diversity in general in um, on boards and commissions. And so something that I would echo what Aaron said, and this I think is very important, I think the council ought to make, I would like to see council make more of an effort to outreach more broadly in the community uh, when we're looking for folks to serve on boards and commissions. Because I tend to think that the message gets out to the same group of people time and time again, and the similar people tend to put their names in. It's a very big community with an awful lot of smart, talented people in that. I'd like to see a more broad range of, of views brought in through the boards and commissions. Anyone else? Okay, next question. Come on. Hi. Rosemary McDonough. Hi. I have a lot of respect for all of you. I like you all. But I want to give you a little pushback about that answer about the food bank, which I think two of the answers are just frankly silly. Um, the concern about the food bank was not uh, dealing with, I don't know, Pope Francis and sickly on, and sickly on starving children or 501c3s. It was that a member of our council who owned the food bank or worked with it was behind in her rent for several months, but it was known to another member of our council and that she got away with it. Now, I'm looking at $100,000 that she spent on two projects that are orphans, 
$75,000 in parking study in Rio Where. So I'm just wondering, what did we learn from that program, that problem, what will you do differently, and how can I feel comfortable that my tax dollars are being spent? Um, one thing that's important to note is that, and I want to look at you when I answer this question, the member of Borough Council that runs the food bank is absolutely recused from all decisions with respect to the rent and the property. That's not my question. Bear with me, please, Rosemary. Um, the rent has been paid. The rent was withheld, my understanding is, because that there, were, there was a landlord and tenant dispute. Do I think it could have been handled better? Yes, I do. So your question then seemed to turn to, and I'm, I'm sincerely trying to make sure I understand it, you have trust concerns. And when it comes to trust, I can't talk about anybody but myself. And I can look you in the face and tell you that you can trust me. I will be honest. I will be forthright. I understand your concerns. I don't think everything is perfect. Um, I hear you. I think we can do better. And I promise you that we will. Number Burrow owns 201 State Line. 201 State Line is managed by a professional property manager. That property manager deals with all the commercial leasing issues related to the property. The Food Bank is a 501c3 organization that rents property at 201 Sabine, and it has its, as its employee an executive director who also serves as a council member. It's complicated. I am entirely comfortable with the way that the borough handled their end of this transaction, which is to delegate all of that responsibility to the professional property manager to prevent the political involvement of council members and their relationships with the council member who's an executive director from influencing that property manager's decision. I cannot control how the food bank as an organization handled that relationship. Unfortunately for all of us, it became a very hot public issue. Um, and I don't think anybody left looking good. But thankfully, when it comes to the numbers, the money is paid. They are in good standing, and we move on. Anyone else? Oops, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, sure, do that first. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Nobody wants. Nobody wants to take that question. Well, no, I was. I was okay. I was gonna, okay, Sam. Uh, you know, I said in my opening that I assume good intent of people, and that largely enables me to work with a population of people that are often labeled as having not good intent in our prison system. And it's really kind of a guiding philosophy. And when I saw what was happening in the food bank, I truly brought with it a lens of good intent. I thought probably incompetence, but not, nothing malicious. Um, and I, I, I just want to point that out, that I don't think anyone at this table is doing this long volunteer hour for the power or the privilege or the, certainly the prestige. Um, so that's just a personal note. To your second question I heard, it was like, how can you trust that you're going to be good stewards of my tax dollars and take this parking study and actually use it? And I think that um, certainly I have an interest. That's one of the reasons what motivated me to eventually run for council. But when you, when you utilize a broader net of community voice through boards and commissions where there are checks and balances to be thoughtful on who you are hiring, how you are using your money, and then how that data and facts are being utilized in the community, um, We'll answer that question of how do you trust us? Because it's a big system with lots of voices. That was hard in Okay. Georgia? Thank you. So I want to say, first of all, staying with this topic, that um, I was at the meeting where a number of people who were supporters of the food bank and volunteers um, were present and spoke, and I was very impressed by the dedication and the commitment of the people there. People were very articulate about what it meant to them to be volunteering and doing that kind of work. And, um, and I was really glad that I was there to get to hear that from so many people. I wanna um, offer some facts about the food bank and about the, um, the way things have been handled. 
when the person, um, when the food bank moved into that space, there was no vetting whatsoever about whether the food bank could pay rent, whether they were an appropriate client, um, you know, tenant or anything. So that didn't happen, and it's important for people to know that. Uh, the food bank moved in in 2013 and paid no rent until 2016, even though they signed a lease in January of 2015, but no rent was paid until the following July. So I think it's really important in talking about this to make a distinction between what a wonderful service this is and how it's been handled. There have never been um, any facts or any information about the running of the food bank, about the financials, that's always been kept secret um, while the person who was running it was sitting on council as the vice president. And I think that's tremendously significant. And I think separating those two things and looking at how it's been held. Oh, and, and I think, Cindy, you mentioned the person doing the volunteer hours. The director is not a volunteer. A lot of people. Oh, gotcha. Okay, yeah. So a lot of people have thought that the director was a volunteer, and they have not been disabused of that notion. But the fact is, the director does get a salary. Don't know. I don't know what it is because that's never been revealed. It's been operating very differently from any other kind of food bank or nonprofit that makes all that sort of thing public. So I want to know. Um, so I just want to share those facts and see if you have anything that you'd like to offer in relation to that. I'm not sure how those comments fit into this question and answer. I've said what I'm going to say. Anyone want to comment? I don't have the facts to comment. Yeah, and I can have, I mean, if you don't know these yeah. facts, I can present them to you. Yeah. I have a question. Well, I have been involved with the Food Trust in Philadelphia for three years, a great organization. I'm involved in a camp that helps underprivileged children with nutrition. I think what is bothering me, and sorry, one more question on the subject because there's a lot of residents that are really upset about this, that every time someone tries to bring up a, a question to the council about ethical violations, possible ethical violations, transparency issues, um, there should be a heightened standard of transparency with an elected official that is running a nonprofit on the side. We all read about it in the newspapers over and over again about things that happen when people have nonprofits and they're not transparent. Um, I give a lot to food related organizations and, and other organizations, but I always make sure I know what the the operating ratio is. That's really important. I think we all as citizens should know, is it is it 90% or 95% that are going to the donors and the recipient or to the recipients? Or is it 20%? And that's I think one of the concerns here that people um, have been upset about this issue and every time they bring it up, it's turned to into well, don't you care about the poor and the needy? Of course we do, of course we do. But we have a, almost like a triage situation of need out there right now. And I think we should all make sure that anything that we support in, in the borough, I mean by having this, or any organization in any of our facilities, um, we have a heightened level of transparency that's required. So I think the questions here always turn into the people that are questioning are bad people that don't care about the needy here. We all care about them. We just want to know that you recognize as candidates that there is possible an opportunity for violations here. I mean, I worked in purchasing for years. You know, when you're in charge of making decisions about money, people try to sway you. I'm not pointing any fingers, I'm just saying you read about it in the papers all the time. We just want to make sure that you as candidates recognize that. Can you? Can any of you say that? Let, let me see if I can take the last two, two comments and put them into the form of a question. What is Borough Council's conflict of interest policy and what should that conflict of interest policy be in your opinion? I 
I think that we have more than one member of council who currently rent space in borough-owned properties. I understand that people have concerns about that. I don't, I'm not on council. I don't run these organizations. I can tell you that as a candidate, as somebody who hopes to serve on council, that I think that the relationship needs to be, as President Uterick laid out, a recusal between those who are making the decision. Like, no, let me make it more simple. The person running business A or organization A, if they're on council, should have zero input or knowledge of how the borough is treating that tenant, that organization. And if members of the public have questions, your questions should be answered. That's all I, I, I don't know what more to give you. As a newcomer, that's the best I have. Go ahead, sir. Um, I agree with you, Ann. Um, I think it's really important that um, moving forward, um, all of the um, finances should be disclosed and should be transparent. I think that's where things fell through the facts. I don't know the whole inside story. I, I mean, I wasn't there, I'm not on council. But I think that um, we have to be vigilant moving forward about different organizations that are not paying rent or, you know, different organizations that we're giving to um, and making sure that we're making wise decisions. Um, it's sort of, it's difficult. Yes, we do care that they, you know, they were feeding the poor and taking care of um, hungry people. Um, but at the same time, it's been quite upsetting to think that um, there is a member of council sitting um, in the position that she is, um, and things were not on the up and up. So I'm sort of talk, you know, caught between a rock and a hard place because I'm not on council and I'm not making decisions. So I think I'm the only person uh, running for council here who has not said a word on any of the food bank questions yet. So I'm, I'm starting to feel like I'm, I'm being avoided. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna grab this one uh, for a second even though I, I barely know how to address it because I am still not sure I understand the nature of the concern. Uh, I think if the borough were to consider a relationship where the borough was donating to the food bank in any capacity, it would be completely correct that all of the food bank's finances should be totally open because that's what you do. As Anne pointed out, you donate to a 501c3 unless you understand their finances very well. To the extent that there's an arm's length relationship and the food bank is a tenant, all I care about is do they pay their rent? Do they meet their contractual obligations? Uh, there was obviously, there was a time period when there was a dispute and I felt a little anxious about that too. Like, wow, how far behind in rent? But to the extent that the dispute is settled now and they're paying rent, I'm, I'm no longer interested in the food bank's finances until such time as they, order, if they were to approach the borough and say, hey, we'd like for you to, to contribute to us as a 501c3. Then I'd be very interested in their finances. I just want to underscore what you said, Michelle, so perfectly in my interest. And, and I, I brought up the good intention because, to be perfectly honest, I thought that the food bank became a personal attack against Gigi and that often there were folks motivated for personal reasons um, that perhaps were not as interested in the conflict of interest. Um, and it really became targeted at one person that if it had been maybe even another council member, things, the reaction would not have been the same on council. With that said, talking about a conflict of interest, underscoring what you said, Michelle, sure. So maybe it is helpful to have a co-created conflict of interest policy in a small town where you are very likely to have people who volunteer, whether it be the food bank or the MBA, that will also sit on council. And I don't want to create a policy that's not going to support someone who's actively evolved as a shop owner to be the mayor or on council. But having something co-created that goes with standards of HR and employment law that is apparent and can be kind of a North Star and guiding policy for our community may make sense. There are ethics laws for the state of Pennsylvania, and every council member is given the opportunity to work with the borough solicitor one-on-one -on -one if they feel those conflicts might arise, and to receive legal advice from the borough solicitor as to how they can best stay within the law, deal with that conflict, 
and avoid any ethical violation. What's, I think, a topic in this community is a higher level of ethics, another standard of care. And um, until that is codified and written, it sort of means something different to every person. And I would caution people to make judgments about an unwritten policy that is different in my mind than yours or yours, and then judge that person. We can develop that standard, and that's something that I would support. And I think there's different levels also, which is one is, is there, is there something ethically that requires you to recuse yourself? Or is there something ethically that requires you to just declare that a potential conflict exists? And then, ultimately, at election time is when people can make their decisions. Anyone else? Next question. One up. Oh, yes, two. So, uh, I don't think, my question is not about trust. Uh, I don't think that's the issue, but there's a, a theme that I hear, whether it be the drainage study that was $100,000, somebody said that was a waste of money. Um, the deferred maintenance issue, which is clearly pressing and really can't be postponed. The pension funding. This issue regarding the failure to pay a monthly rent, which should have been an obvious transaction. So the question is, what's, what, are the, what are your financial structures? You have the appropriate structures in place to do the financial vetting and monitoring that you have to do. How can you make sure that you don't have another $100,000 project wasted? There should have been a, a vetting process or somebody that says, is this worth the money? What's the risk, the downside on this, and should we have spent the money? Do you, are those processes in place? Are your financial structures in place to do that? Um, I can't speak to past councils. Clearly, every decision that was made with respect to spending your money was made by. I'm happy to go forward. I, 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 I'm not thinking about. I just want to. I want to be assured that the candidates know going forward that those structures are in place and we, we will have learned something from the past. The structures are in place. My understanding, and, and, and I'm running with Aaron, having discussions with him, my understanding is that appropriations for funds by prior councils were made by votes of council. It wasn't, so if there were votes that perhaps maybe weren't the right votes. Going forward, am I missing your question? Going forward, I think that everyone at this table agrees that we can do better in terms of making decisions that are wiser for your dollars. Did I, did I miss the question? You're, you're looking healthy. Yeah, no, I just, presumably you're going to have a sponsor of a project. That's got to be vetted. Somebody's got to figure out if it's worth it. So that when it comes time to vote, it's a fully informed vote. And, and, and that's, that's where, that's up to your members of council. You put seven people in a room and three of it say it's a bad idea, four say it's a good idea. It just depends on who you have in that room. There's no rule that says you have to spend 10 hours vetting a project. It's just getting the people in there that are going to take the time. So maybe I'm suggesting there ought to be more structure to the process. I'm sure in a minute. Uh, I think I think we have an incredible responsibility to be good stewards of your tax dollars, which are also my tax dollars. Um, and I think to specifically ask your question, let's use the parking study for an example. Perhaps prior to signing on the dotted line for that summer, we could have leveraged the resources and several other commissions with experts. I'm always in awe of the intellectual capacity we have in our town. So including more voices, you know, should I be reviewing a proposal for an environmental intervention? Absolutely not. I'm not an environmental scientist, but I can name five community members who are that can help inform council to say, educate us, on is this a worthy investment? Is this appropriate, this consultant? Maybe it's not. Um, I think, as I've said before, widening the net, utilizing the community resources that we have, which are plentiful here in Narborough, to help counsel who will ultimately vote on whether or not to pursue and invest in such a study, is an approach that I'd like to see us take at the table. I'm going to hit this from two sides. One is the financial side. In the past year, we've made major changes. We have cleaned up the budget, we have reorganized the entire line item structure to make it more clear so that dollars are actually in the area in which they are being spent. That was not always true. So you could say, hey, 
is that an insurance expense? What's it doing in the police department? Shouldn't it be here? That's been corrected. The second thing that we did is we brought in an outside bookkeeping service, and we don't do our bookkeeping in-house. That way that person has experience with other organizations, and they're following accounting best practices. We've increased the level of our audit, and then we've also separated the function of treasurer from the bookkeeper. Those are financial controls. The other side I'm going to quickly address is how do we decide on who to hire? Is it the way it was six or seven years ago, where different consultants come and interview between, in front of all seven council members, and we're like, oh, we sort of like that guy. He seems pretty good. Or do we put to have the professional staff put together a rubric of all of the different criteria of what we're looking for? Everyone is getting the same questions. They're being graded accordingly. And then there's metrics by which that decision was being made. And if it's a failure later, we can go back and we can look at the data and understand where we went wrong. That's the future. Thank you. That's, um, now, uh, Aaron just said exactly what I want to say, but you know, really well. I, mean, I think that the hiring process is, is where um, the, I mean, there's a lot of room for... Uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of room for mission to happen there if we're not conscious to have a very clear and standardized process and to evaluate each hire as it happens. And um, that's just... So I'm not going to add to that. The, the other piece is that we are putting together a capital plan. And a number of these big ticket items would be ones that, d d if they did not fit within the capital plan, they should not and might be funded. I don't think that committee members, I, if I'm on council, I do not want, as a committee member, the discretion to spend eighty or $100,000 of taxpayer money just cause. I want it vetted, I want it to be consistent with the capital plan so that I know that it, it truly meets the community's needs and it fits within our broader strategic goals. Um, I agree with all of you. I really don't know what else to say. I did listen to our borough council meeting and I was very excited to hear about the capital fund. I think it's going to be great. I think it's something that we haven't had in a while, from what I understand. And I like the fact that we're actually having a bookkeeper and that it's going to take away some of the responsibility from the office staff that maybe they can give some more customer service to us. While I'm not on borough council as a member of as mayor and who takes part, will take part in these meetings, I think the capital plan will go a long way in, in giving us a framework within which to spend our money. And the comprehensive plan that the, the borough is undertaking will help alleviate some of the hodgepodge of financing of projects that have occurred in the past. Just by, by way of a, a little bit of answer and, and the welcome to know that when you have a few spare moments, you may want to go on the website and download the audits. Every borough in Pennsylvania is required to have an audit yearly. And uh, they, I, I will say that it, it can be difficult to parse through them. Uh, I'm looking forward to the 2016 audit and being it, it being less difficult to parse through it, but I have looked at the past three years' audits, and yes, there was room for improvement, and I'm trusting that it has been done. Next question. Oh, uh, Rich, if, if I may, I was just at the last borough council meeting, and our finance head of finance, Charles Cilio, gave a report on the audit, and uh, he said we've now been put in a position that the future audits should be a lot smoother. He did give assurances. Good to hear, but I, <laughs> I like, like Jim, I am a member of the bar for 42 years, so note my skepticism until I read through the audit. Okay, next question. Come on up. Hi, Joel Bigatel, I live on Dudley Avenue. Um, under the current borough, Process is the mayor is in charge of the police department. Uh, do you have any opinion on whether that should continue into the future, or should that function be taken over by the borough council? Hi, um, I think it should remain within the, the purview of the mayor. Um, that is set out by. Of course, you do. Of course, it would be very odd if I thought differently. Um, and, and so uh, that is set forth under Pennsylvania code. Uh, and that is, that is 
statutorily set forth as, as one of the, the duties of the mayor. And I think uh, if you, you have a mayor who takes uh, the time and the initiative to, to thoroughly understand you know, what is going on with the police department and how best to run it in, in light of the needs of the town, I think, I think it's good to have uh, someone in, who has that as a, a point person and working in conjunction with a public safety committee. So it's not just my, my police department, it's our police department. And I will have the benefit of the expertise at the table, hopefully with uh, Cindy and, uh, and others on that committee, to, to run our ideas and good budgeting and uh, good processes through. Uh, I need to preface, this is an absolutely, what I'm about to say is absolutely um, not at all questioning your role as mayor <laughs> or personal. I think this is a really difficult system to sustain. You are asking a volunteer to be available and manage a police force. I teach police and about police. I would never, I would never feel like I had the skills or the abilities to supervise policing. Uh, there are many boroughs that have transferred that responsibility to public safety and a chief of police. I think it's really difficult. I mean, Andrew, you are in a unique position where you have a law degree, your work is in our town, so you're easily accessible, and you have the time to dedicate passionately to working with us on, on for public safety. I think that's a really difficult profile of person to find. And moving forward, I think to shift the responsibility to public safety and a, and a professional police manager uh, is, is wise, or something at least that we should really consider. Um, I think that it's a discussion to be had in the future. It, it's, it's certainly an issue that could be handled differently, but I also think we have to remember that the will of the Narber voters picked a mayor knowing that the mayor would run the police department. And in, 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 term of, in terms of, of our next mayor's first term, I think we have to give this mayor a chance to see what she can do and that future decisions about who runs the police. There's certainly an issue for dialogue, but I do think we need to respect the will of the voters who picked our next mayor. But can I have five more seconds? Just I would have said that answer for absolutely anyone running for mayor. It's really a structural question and not at all a personality question. I want to underscore that. Okay, so I, well, I'll, 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 I will answer the question as well. I mean, I, I agree with Cindy that it's not an ideal structure to have the police force report to a volunteer mayor because as a general, because there's, it's, it's very difficult to know whether or not somebody's going to be able to step up in the community in that volunteer capacity who has the skills and the time and the ability to dedicate to it. So I, I would favor seeing a police chief, um, a professional police manager, not, not management by council by any means. I mean, interfacing with the Public Safety Commission, certainly interfacing with the mayor as well, but I personally would be more comfortable seeing that system as well. It's my understanding, and actually, I, it's more than understanding, um, we haven't had a police chief here since 1983, and the system seems to have worked pretty well. I'm concerned about pay. You know, if we um, have to hire um, a chief, um, or is that within our budget to be able to do that? I'm not putting a money before safety or safety before money. I don't mean that, but I think that's something to consider. Um, I don't know what the recommendation was. I believe the recommendation was to hire two more police officers. On a scale of four right now, which has been budgeted. So I just think we need to give Andrea a try, see what happens. Well, I, I have to editorialize a little bit. I, I was a prosecutor for eight and a half years. I do have a little bit of background here. I do believe in civilian control of police. I think that that is a wise thing to do. And uh, I look forward to uh, the joint civilian control of this police force and the, and the professionalizing of it. My editorial is done. Next question. <laughs> Come on. Sorry. One more question. Um, in the, earlier, 
comments about public safety and the conversation that we just had yeah. um, begs the question of what's wrong. What, I'm sorry, what's, what's wrong? wrong? Um, you sort of suggested, other than the folks who run the stop sign down here in front of the park all the time, you know, uh, I don't. It seems like a pretty safe community. So are there issues that we don't know about, or that I don't know about, or we okay. should know about? So this is that's a really hard question to answer with one minute. So I'll do it briefly, well, and then we can follow yeah, up after. Well, there's good talk too. Um, yeah. So I think there's some low hanging fruit, right? The last time anybody's ever seen someone pulled over for uh, a moving violation um, in our town. You know, I think there's been great concerns about public safety and our kids crossing the street. I can tell you after the scavenger hunt two weeks ago, the number one comment I got was, it's reefer madness at the park at <laughs> 9 o'clock at night. There's an open air drug market that I think many Lower Marion kids travel to our town for. Um, additionally, there's an opioid crisis nationally in Montgomery County and also in our community where I hope that we would have some open dialogues. Additionally, I think that there is technology that can help enhance our policing uh, that we aren't yet utilizing, but also that we are a small town with a small force that we can move from law enforcement, meaning you broke a law and I'm now going to hold you accountable, to one of a model of community justice and public safety. Um, and again, I can't answer that in a minute, but can certainly chat after. Anyone else? We're human beings, and with human beings come, you know, come issues. We are very lucky in this town that we have, you know, not a huge, a huge, massive crime issue. Um, but there are other, there are issues. I mean, we have uh, sometimes break-ins of, uh, of automobiles. We have uh, there is some some drug use, which happens across the across the country. We have traffic violations. We have things we can work on to make tighter and make it a, a, a more uh, a higher level of security and safety for our citizens in, in the world. More questions? Come on up. Hi, I'm Carol Prof. Um, I have a question for those of you running for borough council. And what are your views on density in Norbert and how that looks towards the future? I was waiting for somebody to ask that question. It took a while. Um, my views on density, um, I'm opposed to increasing density here in Norbert. I think it can create um, a magnitude of problems here, like the traffic issue with now, um, public safety. Um, I think that aging in place can be affected by this if they're not able to um, be able to park you know, in front of the building that they live in. Um, I think we have um, 4,200 residents living in a half a square mile. And I can't see me moving forward that um, increasing the density would cause any less of a problem or any more of a problem. Um, I know there was some mention a while ago that in the 50s and 60s the population was greater. And um, so why are we concerned about it now? But the pop it wasn't that big of a population. The population wasn't a problem, it was the amount of cars. The cars were bigger. Um, and I followed a car from the south side today that was massive. We couldn't even go over the bridge. I don't know whether it is a Yukon or whatever. And I'm thinking, this is just me and my little car and this car. So um, I know I'm going to also feel comfortable in saying that if there are situations where um, density would be appropriate, I'm open to hearing that because we're in little pockets here in Norbert that have different needs. Um, I think Norberth is largely built out, and so there isn't a whole lot more room for density. The form-based zoning code right now basically controls any potential for, say, multifamily housing or additional apartment buildings to a very few areas. Um, 
different from the ones where the old zoning code allowed those buildings in some cases. Um, and even within those areas, there are very few lots that will be large enough to sustain those kind of larger multifamily or apartment construction projects. So I don't think, and, and you know, and, you know, build out analyses that we're done. I mean, this was like a five-year program, like of, of intensive analysis and planning to form the form-based zoning code. So we're looking at the potential for modest increases in density. Uh, alternately, you could see decreases in density if the market forces were such that people were coming in and tearing down smaller homes uh, and combining lots to build, you know, mansions. Although the form-based zoning code. To, you know, tends to discourage that as well. So I think based on the fact that we are basically built out, that the form-based zoning code, in my estimation, is doing a good job of, of putting boundaries around possible construction. I don't think we're going to see much change in density one way or another. I think it would be minimal, very de minimis in either direction. When we were discussing the form-based zoning code, uh, it was communicated to me by the solicitor, and I communicated to the public that it is not legal for us to make a zoning code that allows for no future growth. We can't restrain the rights of property owners to, now you can do nothing. And we very carefully formulated the form based zoning code to be legal and hold up to legal challenge uh, by developers by allowing growth, but allowing it in pockets, in areas where it makes sense, where it's transit oriented, because Susan hit the nail on the head. It's not about the people, it's about automobiles. Thankfully, we're living in a magical time. Change is fast, I've mentioned it before. The future of the automobile, none of us know what it's gonna look like in 20 years, but I guarantee you, we will be amazed at what's gonna happen. And it's, our town is uniquely poised to benefit from that change in any of the 20 different ways that it could pan out. And then, we may have a different thinking about density. And we'll make changes to the borough code then. Uh, yeah. So we need people, right? We need people to have our downtown be thriving, to thrive and be economically stable and vibrant. Um, yeah, we have a car issue, not a density issue. There are 5,200 people instead of 4,200 in 1950. And, you know, I'm looking at you, Kim, because, you know, there are ways that we can then comprehensively look at how do you make our streets safer so maybe you would consider biking or walking more to alleviate some of that car density, which really is the issue, um, and, and enhance our walkable town? Okay, let's, let's ask the question about the granny pods since we're oh. talking about density. Um, wait, let me ask the question. The first wait, wait, question. Wait, let me ask the oh, question. Oh, you have to actually ask it again. Yeah, here you go. Okay. Oh, cool. All right, I'll ask the famous question that I asked in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> I just talked to Cynthia off guard. Oh, sorry. So, okay. when I first asked about accessory dwelling units a year ago, and at that time, there were 16 min new municipalities in Montgomery County that had ordinances supporting accessory dwelling units, also known as granny pods. So, NARVA currently does not, and I was curious to know, and I still am, including, including Andrew, um, what is your position with respect to uh, an accessory dwelling unit ordinance for NARVA? Kimberly, would you mind explaining to folks who may not know what an accessory dwelling, um, whatever you just said, it is? <laughs> I know what it is, but I don't know. Okay, sure. So, um, they're also known as granny pots. Um, they're typically much smaller than about a thousand square feet. So they're, they're these tiny little houses that um, are seen in communities in Montgomery County. In your backyard, um, they typically have a tiny little kitchen and a studio at the most. Um, but it helps um, families that have adult children with disabilities that need a little bit of support at home. It helps them live with independence, but with a little bit of family support. It also allows um, folks with aging parents um, to come and live in their backyard again to maintain some independence, but get a little bit of support. Um, and they've also proven to be a really great resource in communities like Narber that are built out um, to allow uh, our seniors that can no longer afford to stay in their big 
2,500 square foot house, or they can't afford to maintain it, they don't have the physical ability to maintain it, but they still want to stay in a walkable community, it allows them a place to go, stay, and remain viable members of our community. I think that's in the Thank you. Sure. So uh, when this, this was the first question asked, um, and I literally almost had to put my head between my legs because the vision of my mother-in-law living in my backyard gave me such pause. <laughs> I babbled for the next two minutes. Um, but then I was able to compose myself and look. Um, there are actually, there are not many lots that in the new zoning code would actually allow for this. I mean, you really are, and I can't find it in here, um, of course, when I need to be. You're talking about a handful of properties that would even qualify for a granny pot. And I think how what I, I would approach this is to the gentleman of the left who asked about the environmental stewardship and our climate change. You know, I don't think I could answer that question without looking comprehensively, looking holistically at what's the issue with water runoff? What's the issue with impermeable space? How would having even, let's say, six accessory dwellings on properties have an effect on our environment? What would the repercussions be on parking? Where I don't think it's a, a simple answer because we have to look holistically at all these other community um, issues. I'll make the same bad joke I made when I got that question back in April. Um, it's tough to answer because my wife's here in the room, but I know mom's watching at home. Um, I think that it's something that we should have a discussion with the Montgomery County Planning Commission about. Generally, it's something that I'm in favor. I've had discussions with people about it. I researched it after you asked the question. And I think if you talk about living in place, aging in place, that if it's done in a manner that the city says it's environmentally responsible, which if you look at some of these ordinances that have been drafted with respect to granny pods, they can cover that. The ordinances can be crafted in a manner in which they can be sustainable. Um, it's an idea that I'm almost universally in favor of. I love the idea, and I love the idea of being able to have a place where you have an elderly parent, um, where you're concerned, where they could have a little independence, and, and but you uh, you can keep an eye on them, or such as a grown child with dis developmental disabilities. Uh, it sounds like a great idea. Like the others have said, it would be something I would like to see the, the environmental impact, the, the parking uh, impact, the um, you know impermeable surface impact, I would like to take a look at all of that um, and have, have all my facts uh, in, in line before making a, a, a final decision. I am generally very positive about accessory structures in general. If you have an impervious surface coverage issue and all of the other code issues and the universal construction code and you can build something uh, unattached actually think it looks nicer in our built environment than just continuing to extend your home in some kind of snake-like manner to fit the available space. Um, an artist studio, an office, it can all be done with zoning code controls that prevent, well, now you have three people driving to that house to work there every day. Or you have a, that can all be controlled, but we have very limited space in the borough. So the more we can make use of it, the more value we can add to the built environment. Wing as well, but also you have to consider that your your property will be reassessed and the tax dollar will go up. So you have to figure if your mother-in-law or whoever is worth next month. Larry is a former realtor. That's cool. That's so cool. All right, we have time for one more. Come on up. Okay, so the question is, what about when the granny for the granny pod is no longer there living in the granny pod and now it's an accessory structure that's potentially rentable? Um, all of that can be controlled through the zoning code. Okay. If 
terms of uh, unrelated individuals living in the same home, um, and as it would relate to a, like a, an unattached unit specifically, just as we do not permit Airbnb, Airbnbs in the borough of Norworth, and we control it, and we've enforced it. Can I, can I just add, though, that there are, that this does already exist in the borough, and in a very behind-the-scenes, unofficial way. So it's just a really interesting question, um, even though it's my question, obviously. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> but I'll just say, like, when I, when I am riding around on my bicycle and when I'm walking around, I see these hidden nooks and crannies. I see these hidden nooks and crannies that are very obviously accessory dwellings operating in folks' back, backyards, and I see little signs that say for rent. Um, you know, hidden next to the bushes and the hedges. Um, so I just think it's interesting that it, it is kind of already unofficially happening, and I'll just leave it at that. I have one more comment there, not to make this up. I am generally of the opinion that if something is happening, and it's not legal, but it's not something you're necessarily against, that if you can bring it into the regulatory structure, then everyone is better off. As a firefighter, to think something is a garage, but really it's a, it's a dwelling, that's a big problem. Or that it was converted to a dwelling without the proper permits and inspections for life safety. Now that is something that happens much more often, I would say, in other communities uh, that are maybe larger and uh, less economically advantaged. But that's something that happens here, to your point, and we need to, we need to bring them into the fold. Okay, we are at the time for closing statements for borough council candidates, and we're going to go in the reverse order that we went last time. And forgive me, because I don't have the numbers in front of you, but I know you're number three. Can no, we, we just give it sitting here? Yeah, or? you can give it sitting there. Ruth, you've, you. got, you've got two minutes. I'm going to try and go under. Awesome. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. I think it says a lot about Narver that we get this kind of turnout, and I thank the Civic Association. One thing I failed to mention in my opening um, was my own background here in Narberth. I'm the acting chair of the Narberth Industrial Development Authority, um, an active parishioner at St. Margaret's Church, and I also chair the campaign for our state rep, who's been a mentor to me, Mary Jo Daly. And I just want to echo what I said in the opening, that I, I really, I, I applaud all the candidates, and I'm really proud to be running with Michelle, Cindy, and Aaron. Um, it's been a great experience through the primary. Um, I think that we, Narberth together brings a unique skill set where we, we've shown our volunteerism, we've shown our involvement, and I think that we can bring those skills to Narberth Council to better serve you. I can promise you that if you put me on council, I'll be a good steward of your tax dollars. I'll listen to you. I'm doing this because I want to make the world a better place. I really care. I care a lot. Um, and I think that one thing I can bring to the table for the borough is relationships with our elected officials up and down the ballot. I am very involved. And one of the reasons I've been doing it is because I think it would be great to bring our federal, state, and county government into Narberth's decisions because we're going to need money. And that's one source to get it. And I would like to try and do that for Narberth. Thank you for your time. I'm going to go 30 seconds under. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for your time this evening. Um, and you have great choices uh, this election. Who will, We will all uniquely contribute to that council table. And I hope to bring a lens of community justice and experience with police to enhance our public safety. I intend to bring a perspective that analyzes the system in place in the borough that will lead to a purposeful and systemic change. I'd like to leverage the intellectual and the professional and the lived experiences of our community members to perpetuate the great strengths of our town and just enhance the future of our beloved neighborhood. Thank you. I do love this borough. And I hope that when my children come of age, that they would want to live here, that it would be affordable for them to live here even if they make me move away before they move in so I'm not too close. <laughs> They're going to put you in a pod. <laughs> I'll never be in the pod. <laughs> Unless it's in space, I won't be in the pod. <laughs> uh, having served for the past almost eight years, I have a record. 
Uh, I've been to a lot of meetings. I've seen many of you. I hope you like what you see. I try to be me. I try to be honest. I try to trust my heart and um, be open and transparent about that record. And I hope that uh, I can have your support to continue leading the borough for another four years. Uh, in my two, coming up on two years as presidency, we've made a lot of changes. And I, I hope to continue that for the better in the future. Uh, thank you once again to the Civic Association for this forum. Um, thank you to my fellow candidate, my fellow Democratic candidates on the Birth Together ticket. I'm really honored to be running with you. And thank you so much, Susan, for sharing the stage with us tonight. It's been an honor to be running with you as well, against you as well. So <laughs> most of all, I want to, it's been nice getting to know you better. Really. So most of all, I want to thank everybody that came out tonight, or is at home still watching on the live stream. Um, being on Dartmouth Borough Council is an incredible opportunity and it's one that I take very seriously. Uh, I believe that I do have the breadth of experience that's necessary for this role and I'm also willing to take the time to develop the depth of knowledge through research, through engaging with and listening to my neighbors um, to make as informed a decision as possible. I know we might not always agree, but I hope that um, as you interact with me, you'll know that I'm making an informed decision uh, with sincerity and integrity and what I really believe is in the best interest of the borough as a whole. As I mentioned earlier, I usually um, spend election day in the, uh, at the polls as a judge of elections. I won't be able to do that this year. Um, but nonetheless, voting is very, very important to me. So I guess the last thing I want to say is please do come out and vote on Tuesday and grab a neighbor or two and make sure to let people know. Uh, come out and vote whoever you vote for. It's so important. And thank you so much for coming. Good night, everyone. Also, to all of you, it's been a pleasure sitting up here and an honor as well. We run against you, all of you, however we want to look at this stuff. Um, the past few months have been amazing and an inspiring experience for me. Um, getting to know more of you, reacquainting with people I haven't seen in years, forming a deeper appreciation for the commitment and responsibility of being a council member. Much of this work can be tedious and time consuming. But our current council people and previous residents have been volunteering and giving their time for generations because they know how important it is to get it right. There is a great deal of concern right now about the issues of our country and lack of civility and grace. And I'm heartened by interacting with all of you during the past several months. Norbeth is and will continue to be a wonderful example of democracy, empathy, and civility. We have a large and growing awareness that we can pull together as a community even more. We have the power to change what is not working for us. Listening, sharing, and being open to new ideas will give us the best possible solutions to the issues of our town. I'm excited about the opportunity to be one of our facilitators at Borough Council for the future. I hope by attending this forum, you have a better understanding and knowledge of the issues my experience, my people skills, and I sincerely hope you vote for me next Tuesday, November 7th. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause. <laughs> So, I presume that you all will come out to vote next Tuesday. Thank you for attending. Oh.